wonderful to be with you guys here. Um, happy, I guess, anniversary, happy birthday to the church, uh, 40 years. It's incredible. This morning, as we come to Lord, I, I started off as I was prepping this message, um, really starting off kind of with this idea of um, how is it that we know that something is God's will. And yet, the more that I studied, the more I kind of came back to a certain theme that's, that's going to come out in terms of just the importance of hearing from God, specifically from his word, and responding to him in prayer. And so I want to preface first by saying that God is able to speak to us in multiple ways. And so I don't want to fail to acknowledge that, that God can speak to us through other people, that God can speak to us through circumstances, that God can um, you know, speak to us um, just directly through the Holy Spirit by, by you know, um, giving thoughts and impressions. But even when we look at the scriptures, um, even pre-Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, typically people hear the voice of God. And so I, I kind of, the more that I studied the scriptures, the more I came back to these verses that talk about that. So I'm going to spend most of my time camping there, but I don't want to give you the only impression that that's the only way that God speaks to us. But I will say in general, I think it's nearly impossible for us to just really have a strong sense that, hey, this is God speaking to me without being in his word and being in prayer in response to the things that God is revealing to us through his word. Okay, so I want to preface that because that's an area that I'm not going to really touch, but I do want to acknowledge that. I don't want to limit God. So this morning's um, message is entitled Listening to God as the Foundation of Our Lives, and we do begin with this parable of the sower. Um, it's a very familiar parable, um, and, and it's really interesting, you know, the parable speaks about four kinds of places where seed, the word of God, is, is sprinkled and, and the different responses to it, and particularly this parable speaks about the condition of a person's heart, and, um, you know, and, and they yield different fruit, and in some, there it doesn't yield fruit, and, and the word of God is not able to get deeply implanted. And so for any of us who have ever tried to plant anything, grow plants, grow vegetables, we get a pretty good idea that this is something that takes time. This is important because a lot of times when we are seeking God's will about a particular situation, um, we're like on a timetable and we're typically rushed, right? We're like, oh man, like, do I stay at my job? Do I leave my job? Do I stay in this relationship? Do I, you know, do I, um, you know, do I, I don't know, move? Do I do this? And so we're on a timetable. But, you know, the key is whether we're on the same timetable with God. And so I just want to kind of preface that. Because sometimes in the midst of our seeking God, or it becomes a season where we start seeking God more than ever, and we almost feel like, hey, God, I'm seeking you now, um, you owe me an answer. And that's not exactly the way that God works. You know, God's not on our timetable. Actually, the whole thing is that God's trying to get us on his timetable. And in fact, he might even be like, hey, I'm not going to answer you because I want you to go through this process of seeking me. That's actually maybe more important than just giving you an answer to your question, okay? And I think there's also times where when we're on a deadline where it's so important that we go through that process so that it can become a process that's a regular part of our lives. God is more interested in transforming our lives than for us to have the answers that we think that we need. Okay, so that's really, really kind of important. But in Luke um, 8, 4, 18, um, particularly in the end of the parable, so he tells us this parable about the sower, 
And then right after, he tells us another parable about light. And he talks about how there's a light, you don't hide it, and in time it's going you know, to reveal everything. And, uh, and, and listen to the words of verse 18. And there's a couple of really important principles to draw out here. He says, therefore, take heed, be very careful how you hear. For whoever has to him, more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. The more we hear, the more we get. The more we hear God speaking, the more we get. And there is also a converts principle here as it comes to our heart. It, it's a reminder that what's so crucial to us hearing from God is a relationship with him. That we could have grown up in Sunday school, we could have gone through Awana, we could know a bunch of memory verses, and yet, it's, if we don't use it, it's, it's very easy for us to, even what we have, to lose it, as Luke 8.18 says. And so, so Jesus tells us, be careful how you hear. Take heed. Taking heed isn't just being careful, but it is this idea of paying attention to take very intentional steps to guard what it is that we're paying attention to. And so now I got a couple of pictures up here. Um, oh, did you jump ahead? Okay, can we go back to the picture with the Bible and the printing press? Or is, is this like an older version of mine? Okay, um, it's okay. So. When we think about hearing from God, we often think about, I have a picture of a Bible and a picture of a, a young lady reading the Bible. And next to it, I got a picture of, okay, perfect, of the, of the printing press. And one of the reasons is because we have to remember the time. The printing press was, I, th I think it was 1640 that it was, I don't know, it could be much, I, I don't remember the exact date. But basically, at the time that Jesus is writing this parable, there was no printing press. In fact, at that time, the Bible was orally given. Very few people had copies of the Bible. And so when Jesus says this, he says, hey, be careful how you hear, right? Because when they heard the word of God, it was very often oral. And so I want to kind of, you know, so even though the Bible says, hey, it doesn't say be careful how you read, the idea in our reading is to hear from God, okay? And so I want to say those two things are, you know, for us, when we hear here, it, it's not, it, you know, Jesus is then just saying, hey, be careful how you hear when you come to church and you hear a sermon. But also, be careful how you hear or read when you are spending that time alone with God. It's, it's what is your heart's attitude as you approach the word of God, sorry, do we have a technical? Oh, just use the mic? Okay, sure, that'll work. Okay, so what is your, what is your heart's disposition as you come to God's word? Okay, and so in Luke, we're given a warning sign, and, and essentially God is saying, hey, listen, and listen well. And so now we jump to another verse, and um, this is a verse I've actually preached on before here, but this is, in a sense, I've entitled today, oh, let me turn this off, is it giving feedback? Because, okay, that's better, okay. Building a life on a solid foundation, all right. And, um, and this is actually, for, for me, this is, uh, okay, so, sorry, um, all right, there we go, perfect. Building a life on a solid foundation. And so here Jesus tells another parable. It's a really simple one. He says, whoever hears these sayings of Jesus and does them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
When the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house. It did not fall, fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of Jesus and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And so notice in both situations, they hear the word of God. But there's two. Right? One hears the word and does it. Compared to a person who built his house on solid rock. Okay? He is the, the guy in the picture with um, on the solid foundation. Versus the other person um, who hears the word but does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And when you see in the picture, you know, this house is about to fall off the picture because that could happen when the winds and the, and the rain come, right? And so it's a very simple analogy, but there's a difference between someone who's on a solid foundation and someone who the scripture calls foolish, which is, you know, especially in Proverbs, the word foolish is often um, associated with someone who just, um, it, it's associated with unbelief, but also the result of that unbelief results in an unwise, um, un unwise living, okay? And so I actually want to differentiate between hearing and listening, okay? Hearing is simply the act of receiving sound waves through your ears. It's a part of the five senses. It happens unless you actively block it out, unless you put on some earphones, you put on your AirPods, and you're like, hey, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to hear this. And it's a passive process that often requires no concentration or attention. So you don't have to try to hear. Just like right now, we can hear a little bit of the piano from the other service, right? Like, we don't have to intentionally try to hear. It just happens. Listening is hearing and understanding what you hear. And so you see, uh, I tried to find a, a rabbit. That's a rabbit there. I had to make them smaller to fit the screen there. But, you know, yeah, I tried to find something with really big ears, okay? Um, yeah, it was funny because I was like, oh, I should probably put a person, but... Um, yeah, that, that just was not pretty. So, um, yeah, so we, you know, and listening involves our ears, but it also involves our mind. It also involves our heart. Remember, Jesus tells us, right, to love him with all of our heart, right, all of our mind, all of our strength, everything that is within us, right? And so listening is a choice not only to hear, but to analyze, to meditate on what it is that you have heard. It's an active process which requires concentration, empathy, curiosity, motivation. Okay? And so there's a difference between hearing and listening. Pastor Wade Hughes, and it's really interesting, um, he uh, actually, and this guy, um, he talks a lot about um, physiological thing. He actually did this whole sermon series where he talked about um, the eight different um, systems of the body and how um, that speaks to God. I don't know. He's, he's surprisingly not a medical doctor, but he says, hearing is noise and sounds coming to your ears. It is a physiological act of hearing sounds. Listening is paying attention to the sounds and to give thoughtful consideration. The goal of listening is to understand a listening ear leads to an understanding heart. Listening is a loud form of kindness. Really, really interesting. I do want to, however, um, and, and I'm not going to, this is just a very quick word study. It is not comprehensive by every mean, by any means. Um, but we, yeah, here's a couple of Greek words. And there's a couple on the top that talk about hearing, to hear and hearing. And then you could see that there's a hoopa, right? It's, a, it's like a hyper 
to listen attentively, okay? And so often we will see this in the scriptures. And then we also see um, another word that almost looks like emotional, right? But it's to take in one's ear, to hearken. And so it's really important, like even though there's these different words, even when the words are just about physical hearing, it's usually accompanied by something. So, for example, in the verse that we just read in Matthew, right, who, who you know, the, the, the parable about the solid foundation and the sinking sand, it says, whoever hears these sayings of Jesus, but then attached to it is, is and does them. So even when the Bible uses language that's just talking about the physical act of hearing, there's usually something attached to it that tells us, hey, don't just hear these words, but meditate on them. Don't just hear these words, but do something with them. So like in this passage, it talks about, hey, whoever hears these sayings of Jesus and does them. So even in the context of that verse, he, he makes it really plain. There's two types of people, one that hears, it, hears God's words and does something with them, and one, a person that hears God's word doesn't do something with it. In the Hebrew, and once again, this is just one word, so I'm not here to do a comprehensive word study. Um, the word uh, shema is hear or listen, but you'll often see verses where it is repeated, okay? And so the word will be repeated twice, and essentially it is like, it is like that hyper, right, to listen closely. So from God's point of view, especially in the Old Testament, the same listening to God, hearing God, is the same as keeping covenant. So when God says, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. Even though, even if a word is just, you know, to, to hear, in, in, in God's view to his covenant people, when he says, hear, he, he's essentially saying, keep covenant with me, basically obey listen and obey and a good example of this is in exodus with pharaoh who heard god's message in fact multiple time he hears god's warning right you know god sends moses and moses is like hey you know these plagues are not going to stop until you let god's people go and pharaoh hears him but he refuses to listen, and we see the result, plague after plague after plague, okay? And so, and so I'm, I'm saying this because in the Bible, you're going to read verses, and you're going to see, some will say hear, some will say listen, some will say hearken, some will say take heed, but when you see these verses in their context, it is very, very rare that it's just going to be talking about this physical act of letting sound come in one ear and go out the other. There always is an exhortation um, where God is telling us not just hear, but, but take to heart when I'm saying to you, think about it, chew on it, meditate on it, take it seriously. of course, we have the perfect example of Jesus who says, not my will, but your will be done. Whether the word is hear or listen is used, the author of these words should cause us to have a posture of obedience. So, so this is also my point here. Even if a word is that is used as here is just talking about a physical act. Is there not a difference in how we listen to somebody depending on who that person is, right? For example, for those in here who are married, is there not a difference when your wife says something to you versus when any random person, like a coworker, says something to you, right? 
um, <laughs> for those of us who are um, not married, is there not a difference when our mother says something to us versus when any coworker says something to us? And so we have to remember that when we read the words of God, right, that it's God that's talking to us. That in itself should cause us to listen with our ear, our heart, and our mind. That in itself, the authority of God's word. And we kind of hate that word authority, right? Because we don't like this idea that someone can tell us what to do and how to do it. But it is God. And it once again, it comes back to that relationship, right? Because basically it is, can I trust this person? Can I trust this person, right? Can I trust Jesus? And, and hopefully the answer is, is, is yes. There's a story told about a missionary who, um, who was a missionary translator, and he was trying to find a word for obedience in the native language of, um, of the people that he was ministering to. He lived amongst a people who, this was a virtue that was seldom practiced, and so he wanted to translate the New Testament in their language. As we returned home from the village one day, he whistled to his dog who came running at full speed, and an old native seeing this said, admiring in the native tongue, your dog is all ears. And the missionary knew that he had found his word for obedience, that he was going to, tr to translate. Ultimately, hearing God comes down to obedience. It's a word that, once again, we, we, we naturally fight against sometimes, right? Just this idea that I'm being asked to obey. But see, when we see it in a context of a relationship, when we stop and we, and we go back and, and it comes back to this, who is God? And, and, and I guess in a personal sense, what is it that I think about God? Because obedience often just comes down to that. Do I trust God more than I trust myself? Do I believe that God has my best interest more than I have my best interest? Do I believe that God is wiser than me? And these are hard questions to ask. These are questions that um, often our peers don't even know how to answer. You know, I find a lot of times when I talk to my friends, they just tend to always agree. And I think they're trying to be good friends. I think they're trying to be supportive. I think often friends will affirm us in whatever it is that we do, as long as it's not like blatantly, obviously bad. But see, and this is what I was talking about in the beginning, God can talk to us through friends. But ultimately, this is about us personally with God our personal relationship with him, our spending time with him. And it's when we do that that it becomes easier and easier for us to know specifically when it is that, that God is uh, talking to us. The next slide. Uh, Jesus is talking and he's telling this parable in John 10 where he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And once again, and they follow me. Once again, there's this idea of obedience there. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my Father are one. 
My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The context of John 10, of course, is that Jesus is declaring himself to be the true and the good shepherd. And he watches over, and he lays down his life for the sheep. Now, it's important because, you know, in John 10, as, you know, this is verse 27, so it's kind of, you know, a lot has happened in the first verses, but, you know, the shepherd um, is protecting the sheep from those who want to attack the sheep. In fact, in, um, in the earlier verse, it says that, um, that there's a thief who, who's coming to, to steal and kill and destroy. And so, you know, so when Jesus says, hey, my, my sheep, they hear my voice and they follow me. Yeah, it, it's quite often that in dangerous and desperate situations, we will call on God. But, but you know, these parables of the kingdom are, are meant to be ways that we are supposed to live our, our daily lives, right? And, and, and so there is this recognition that there is constant danger er, around us. And when we stop and think, we live in a culture right now, and I, and I would say in any age, there's always been opposition to God. And, and that's not going to stop. And in fact, as the more time that passes, it's not getting better. And so there's so many things out there that are going to um, encourage us, in a sense, to not follow God. And so this is where that part is so important, that those questions I asked you earlier is, who is God to you, and do you, how trustworthy do you see him? Do you see God as someone that you can trust more than yourself? Because when it comes down to it, and we break down every situation, we kind of come back to this relationship that we have with God. And we kind of come back to this question of, do I trust him? Do, do I don't? And, and see, it's important because um, we can get stuck on this idea of, you know, we, we read John 10, 27, and we get, we get stuck on this idea of, you know, the, you know quite, quite often the conversations I have around this passage when I do Bible studies on it or, or I talk about with someone is people will say, well, it says my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And the first thing they say is, well, I haven't been hearing God's voice. Am I one of God's sheep? And, and I want to say that the point of this passage is not to scare you. In fact, there's two things. Uh, first, in, in 27 through 30, um, twice in the passage, he says that no one can snatch a sheep from his hand. And in fact, um, we see in Luke 15 and Matthew 18 that Jesus tells a parable about, about a shepherd who leaves the fold of the 99 to pursue the one sheep that is lost. And so I'm not saying that that's not important. It's absolutely important that we know. But I'm also saying that the emphasis of the passage is that God knows his sheep. And that is a motivation for us to know his voice. It isn't this fear of not being saved as much as it is that we see how much this God loves us. That in the midst of dropping this truth bomb on us, he gives us this double assurance that him and the Father, that, that no one can snatch us from the Father's hand if we belong to him. That he's the good and the true shepherd that will lay down his life for the sheep. That he is the true and good shepherd that will leave the 99 to pursue the one. He so desperately loves us. That then requires a response our part. So it's really important because, see, in, in Luke 15, 2, um, 
once again, in the, in, the, in the parable where Jesus leaves the 99 to pursue the one, it's in the context of these Pharisees who were upset that Jesus welcomes sinners and, and eats with them. And so John 10, 27, Jeff says that the sheep hear his voice and know them and they follow them. It kind of amazes me. I was reading about shepherds, and it's really interesting that the shepherds actually do know their sheep by, by, um, you know, by just, I don't know. Like, I don't know if it's by their sound or this and that. I mean, I kind of get it. I don't know if you've ever dog sat, like, multiple dogs. Like, you can distinguish them from their bark. (laughs) You really can. Like, (laughs) You know, I don't know, like, I think the most dogs I've ever, I've ever sat at one time was like maybe four dogs. But you know, like someone walks around the neighborhood and all of them, all of them start barking and going crazy. You can actually, you know, and you don't need to be in the same room and you can tell which dogs are are barking. I don't know if that's how it is for shepherds and they got, you know, all these sheep, but it wasn't uncommon as I read about shepherds and, in, in, uh, in the old, you know, in, the, in Jewish times, I guess, um, where it wasn't uncommon that they, they knew all the names of their sheep. They, they knew them. So it comes back to the Romans ten seventeen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Also is this, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So here's three safe assumptions that we can make. Number one, that it pleases God when we grow in our faith. So I'll say this. I told you in the very beginning that there are multiple ways that God speaks to us. And the one that I'm kind of really emphasizing today is spending time and having the right heart as we approach God's word. Here's the thing. When we do that, we grow in our faith, and it always pleases God. That's always something God wants is when we grow in our faith. And so even if in reading God's word, he doesn't answer your question for whatever reason that you're seeking his will, you've lost nothing. You've still gained. Because there are people who, you know, that's how it is, right? They, it's almost like they don't really read God's word until they're kind of desperate for an answer for something. And so for number one, it's a safe assumption to say, God is pleased when we grow in our faith. And faith comes from hearing, at least that's the, what the, faith comes from hearing, reading the word of God. And so we have done nothing but gain when we spend time with God in his word, whether we receive the answer to whatever part of God's will that it is that we're seeking. Okay, so I want to say that because once again, um, you know, as we grow in our faith, there may be times when the way that, um, you know, where maybe the thing that we're seeking all of a sudden doesn't become so important as we um, grow closer to God. I'll just say that multiple times, and especially in some major, major decisions in my life, um, God's word and prayer have just intersected. And specifically with whatever circumstance was going on in my life that I was praying about. And so I've seen God um, just answer prayer and and um, and speak through his word. um, Just as we adapt that as a lifestyle, as a spiritual discipline, rather than just for the purpose of seeking an answer. 
And so one of the ways God reveals his will to us is through his word. And I want to say it is by far, I want to say, the safest way, too. So I did tell you that, yeah, God does speak through people. And we see this in the scriptures, too, right? God spoke to King David through Nathan. <laughs> he spoke to Balaam through a donkey. God spoke to Moses in a burning bush. God can speak any way that he wants, right? But most certain, when we see God in his word and he reveals himself to us, whether that pertains to the circumstance or the answer that we're seeking, it has tremendous, tremendous value in our lives. And we see God. We often talk about how the goal of our lives is to give glory to God. And I'm going to give you a very simple definition of glory, which, which I kind of like. And I, and I think it, it's, you know, giving glory to God is basically just to shine the light on him. That's what it means to give glory to something. It's just to shine light on it. And so even as we read God's word, it's an extra thing that we learn to shine the light on Christ. And so it goes back once again to this. Why do I want to listen to God? Well, someone will say, I want to do his will. Then the question would be asked, why do his will? And it comes back to, because I believe that his will is the best for me, and it's better than my current situation. And that's what we really have to ask. See, it's easy to say that we want to do God's will. But quite often, when it comes down to it, it that's what it comes back to. Do I trust God more than I trust myself? Um, I was at a church where um, our church was known, it was kind of sad, it was, it was known for being the church of single guys. We had a lot of good brothers. And it was really funny because we had a lot of sisters who they would pray very specifically for what they wanted. So this is a, we could have a debate about this, right? I'm not going to go there. But they would pray that, oh, the guy that I have to date has to be at least six foot. There was a lot of 5'10", 5'11 brothers at our church. And I'll just say, okay, and I'm not saying I know God's will, but I'll just say some of these sisters ended up with these really jerky guys that were 6'2", that were not very godly guys. They might have gone to church. I don't even know if what their true motive was for going to church. And they end up going through years of bad relationships before they recovered from it, and some didn't. And, and I say this because, see, why listen to God? I want to do his will. Why do his will? Because I believe that his will is best for me. But when it comes down to it, once it goes back to that question of our relationship with him, really, do I really believe that? And, and so, and, and by the way, I don't see it in God's word, right, where God's like, oh, I'm going to give you a, a spouse with the exact traits that you want. And I, I think most married people would say, could be able to testify how God's put that all together for them, right? And, and how, you know, they, they learn different things like that. And so it comes back to, to our motives. And here's the, here's the last verse that I want to leave you with. James 1.22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself and do what it says. And I want to focus on that phrase, Deceive yourselves. It, that, that phrase makes me so sad because there's already so many things out there that are trying to deceive us. We have an enemy that is out there trying to deceive us. We, we see the world and its values, and that's definitely at many times trying to deceive us. We don't need to add self-deception to that list. You know what I mean? Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Don't just hear the word. Listen to it. And so it, it comes back 
to that. My old discipler, um, Pastor Stephen Hahn, um, says, the will of God is revealed to the heart that is willing to obey. There's an old uh, Peanuts comic strip where uh, Peppermint Patty uh, wants to be merry uh, at, during the Christmas play. And so she's talking to Marcy, and she's like, hey, um, I want to be, yeah, I'm going to be merry. I think I'm just going to be merry at the Christmas play. And, and Marcy says to her, well, uh, that role's already been assigned. But Marcy says, uh, you know, Peppermint Patty's like, no, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be Mary. I'll, I'll just talk to the guy. I'll, I'll just be Mary. And then uh, she's like, but, you know, and so they go back and forth a couple of uh, blocks. And at the very last one, you know, Marcy just says, I'm not, I'm just not going to talk to you anymore. You never listen. And, and so that's the idea is that the more that we are people that listen to God, the more he will speak to us. So let's not just be people that will only hear what God has to say when we need an answer for a situation or something. I'm not saying that God's not going to be extra gracious and, and can't do that. But it's just that when it's a regular thing in our lives to hear from God, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Augustine says this, Remember this, when people choose to withdraw far from a fire, the fire continues to give warmth, but they grow cold. When people choose to withdraw far from light, the light continues to be bright in itself, but they are in darkness. This also is the case when people withdraw from God. I'm going to close with uh, this picture. And this picture uh, is of a cell phone, of course, and... Um, and I think about my, my best friend. You know when my best friend calls me? Um, I don't even need to see the name on my cell phone. If I just say swiped right and just, and in fact, often my best friend calls me and goes, hey, it's me. And I know who it is. I know who it is. And this is essentially what it is that we want with God. That there are times when I'm seeking God for something and, and I know distinctly that God is speaking to me. And it's not something that happens overnight. And, and that's kind of what I'm getting at. I'm getting at that this is the pattern that we want for our lives, that we hear God's word and we listen and we obey. And the blessing isn't this, okay, I obeyed God and, um, and I have this quote unquote like feeling of feeling good and assurance, but it's growing this relationship with him so that when he speaks to you, you, you know that even a change in the tone of voice when I talk to my best friend, I, I, I know like, I know I get a feel almost for what's going on in her heart, right? And and that's what we're aiming at is to where we are so familiar with the voice of God that it doesn't need to say God on caller ID and and, and we say hello, you know, because quite often, right? We're just like oh, but even if it was no name on there and we swiped right and we picked up the phone and we heard the voice, we we would know who that is. That, that's what we're aiming at, brothers and sisters. Um, let's, let's pray. Sorry, we're, we're running behind. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for these passages that we read, meditated on, and considered today. God, I pray for the congregation of EFCW. I know that they are a congregation that loves your word and that loves you. And so I pray that today's word, you would, your Holy Spirit would bring these verses to memory. God, that we would not only be hearers of word, but we would be doers. And that, God, as we grow in love and in our relationship with you, that we would hear from you often and be able to discern and make wise decisions in life so that our lives can bring glory and honor and shine the light upon you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.